I want to welcome you on uh, behalf of uh, Kami Gaston and myself. Um, we're excited to have this conversation with you about canoeing the mountains, about uh, adaptive leadership principles and how they apply to this season and in the months uh, to come that are full of so much uncertainty but opportunity as well. Just to give you a sense of how um, this Zoom call will unfold, uh, we'll uh, go back and forth between uh, Cami or myself sharing a little bit of, of those leadership principles and offering some thoughts. And then um, a couple of times in the midst of the call, we'll shift into breakout rooms. So, uh, and we have several other folks on the call from the conference staff, uh, thanks to them uh, for being with us. And uh, they'll facilitate uh, some of those breakout room conversations where we can uh, dig in a little more deeply and reflect a little more personally about um, how these principles you know, intersect with where we are and what we're learning and what they might imply for us. So we'll have, again, this back and forth between some teaching and then some sharing and dialogue and learning uh, with one another. Uh, and at the end, we'll definitely have some time for uh, some whole group uh, Q&A perhaps, and um, you know, concluding kind of conversation. So that's uh, a little bit about the flow of the day. And before um, I pitch it to Cami uh, for a kind of introduction, uh, let me lead us in a prayer. We all pray with me. A holy and steadfast God, we find ourselves in so many ways in uncharted territory. And uh, in this season in which we don't have all of the answers and we're not always sure what the right steps are to take next, God, we are thankful that you are always with us, that you are our rear guard and our shepherd leading us. God, on this call, we... Um, we hope that your spirit will move in our midst, help us to see new things about ourselves, about our churches and our communities, about the wider landscape, so that we may step into this uncertain and uncharted uh, territory with a, a greater degree of confidence, and that we may lead our congregations forward in a spirit of adventure, in a spirit of a learning journey that will change us all change us all for the better. And God, we give you thanks again for your, your constant companionship along the way. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks, Andy. Well, um, about, gosh, a few years ago, 2017, I uh, discovered that uh, this book, Canoeing the Mountains, was um, a great resource for um, church leadership. And I gave the book to all of the pastors who were at that time serving in the Metro District in order to uh, give them an opportunity to uh, read what P Todd Bolsinger says about um, what it takes to do change agility. And as I did that, um, offered the, not just the pastors, but the lay leaders uh, ship in the Metro District the opportunity to also go through the book and ask questions um, and bring up ideas that could lead us forward. So, um, so the reason why I found this particular book so engaging is because Todd, Todd Bolsinger uses canoeing the mountains um, as a metaphor for change leadership or leadership agility. Um, in uncharted territory. And one of the things that he says is that, um, is, is that change, uh, it, we can't always anticipate change, but we should anticipate needing to change um, in our leadership. And he utilizes Lewis and Clark's vision um, of exploring um, from the East to the West to try to find a, a water passageway as an example of how, um, um, how leaders need to be able and willing to change given 
the circumstances changing in and around their lives. And uh, so, as you recall, Lewis and Clark were a team, but um, as the book says, they weren't always a team. Um, that um, one of them was uh, tasked to be the leader, but they chose to um, actually share that leadership. And as they shared that leadership, um, they found themselves uh, in Great Falls, uh, what we know as Great Falls, Montana, and um, at a time where they needed to try to traverse something that they weren't expecting. Um, and so they had to take the canoe, and I've seen a replica of that canoe, and it was no small canoe, um, out of the water, try to traverse the Great Falls, and then continue to go up the Missouri River. And as they continued to go up the river, what they found was that the east did not look like, uh, I'm sorry, the west did not look like the topography of the east, and that they had to spend some time um, trying to figure out now what to do because they had a plan and that plan needed to change because the topography and territory changed and they utilized um, the people that they had in their their team um, and added a few uh, to be able to go into territory that was unknown um, topography that they'd never been around um, food sources um, and berries and things like that that they'd never seen before to know what to eat. Um, and they utilized the, the person, uh, an, a Native American woman and her gifts and abilities to help them traverse um, something that they knew nothing about. And so um, the lessons that I think Todd Bolsinger brings out in uh, this particular book really lay very uh, easily on top of our our need for change management and um, change agility and leadership agility. And so um, that's why we are jumping off into this book today, given the fact that five years later, here we are in a, a place that no one really ever expected in such a, um, a, a quick way. And so um, I want to pass that on um, off to uh, you, Andy, as you can talk a little bit about the kind of things that we need in order to lead change. All right. Thanks, Cammie. So in Canoeing the Mountains, uh, Bolsinger outlines basically three skill sets or three um, competency areas that are crucial to our ability to uh, be a part of leading uh, change. And the first, uh, we're just gonna touch on very briefly, just a minute or two, and then we'll again dwell a little bit more on the second and the third. So the first, which you see on your screen there, is technical competence. Uh, pastors often joke that in times like these, um, that seminary didn't prepare us for this. But technical competence, the kinds of skills uh, that it implies, they are the very things that seminary actually did prepare pastors for. Uh, preaching and teaching, pastoral care, ordering the life of the church, um, these kinds of skills and these kinds of uh, behaviors. The book makes an important point that uh, we gain our credibility as leaders by demonstrating competence in these areas. And again, I'm speaking mainly to pastors in this moment, although certainly lay leaders have their own arenas for uh, demonstrating competence uh, within the life of a community. But for pastors, uh, we gain our credibility by the way that we uh, care responsibly for the gospel message, which has been entrusted to us, the way we care responsibly for people's souls in the congregation and community, and the way that we order the life of the church. So, um, again, we're not going to dwell at length on technical competence, but it is important to lift up that um, for all of us as leaders, our ability to be a part of this learning journey, journey with our congregations 
our effectiveness in that. It hinges on the technical competence that we've shown uh, to date um, and in the technical competence that we demonstrate moving forward. And the last little point I just want to lift up about this um, is just my own thought that for the past two months, I've heard a number of pastors comment that um, as, as you have stepped into the uh, online space in new ways, that uh, there's been a lot of grace uh, among the, the folks in your congregations. Um, if things haven't gone just right, um, you know, that's been okay. There's a shared understanding that everyone is um, on a steep learning curve, learning lots of new things at a rapid pace. And again, there's been a lot of grace. But it occurs to me that sometime soon, and maybe we're there, but sometime soon, um, our ability to be in ministry online will, uh, will become a part of the skill set that we're expected to have. Um, a part of the, the skill set that we are going to be expected to demonstrate competence in. It's going to move from off the map to on the map, to use the language of the book. And so um, it, just, it occurs to me that's probably something for all of us to see clearly, and uh, that may guide some of the way that we move forward. All right, so as I said, we just wanted to touch on technical competence, but next I want to shift to um, the second of the three skill sets or competency areas, and that's relational congruence. I'm going to begin, and then Cami is going to uh, follow on with some more thoughts and ideas about relational congruence. So I love one of the phrases that um, a mantra almost that comes through in the book is this, stay calm, stay connected, and stay on course. It's the middle of those phrases, stay connected, that relates to relational congruence. Another quotation uh, from the book that uh, I have underlined and highlighted and pasted in different places um, is one from Margaret Wheatley, and it says this, it is possible to prepare for the future without knowing what it will be. Now that, that ought to be encouraging for us right now uh, with so many unknowns over the next month or two or the rest of this year. But she says it's possible to prepare for the future without knowing what it will be. The primary way to prepare for the unknown is to attend to the quality of our relationships, to how well we know and trust one another. In the midst of this ongoing time of unrest and uncertainty, and even as we emerge from our sheltering in place reality and begin to uh, craft a new normal, it's so critical that we uh, be intentional about staying relationally connected with, uh, with our people. And so uh, I'll just name the question here, but a question I hope that we'll wrestle with when we move into our breakout rooms is this, um, how are we being intentional about staying relationally connected? Uh, us with other individuals within the church and us with uh, groups within the church, the kind of groups where uh, there are healthy relationships that make it possible for us to process all of the changes that are happening and wrestle with the implications of those changes and begin to try to prepare for what that means for us. Uh, one last note about uh, relational congruence and staying relationally connected is that those relationships must be marked by trust. Um, trust, trust is essential. Another quotation um, that I love from the book is from a guy named Jim Osterhaus, who's a psychologist and an executive coach. And he says, trust is gained like a thermostat and lost like a light switch. The, uh, the, the significance of that to me is that trust is something that is built over time. It's built through relational congruence by uh, consistently being the same person in whatever setting or circumstance we're in. 
Uh, it's built by repeatedly doing what we say and practicing what we preach. It's built through our daily actions and practices that express our character and our values. Again, something that we gain over time. I want to, as I was reflecting on this um, in preparation for today, it occurred to me that trust um, is not built through always having all the answers. And that's critical in a time like this. In fact, if we um, attempt to come across as though we have all the answers, that could um, ironically undermine our trust because the wise ones among us know that there aren't easily uh, found answers these days. So no one expects us to have all the answers and trust isn't built by always performing uh, perfectly, by executing everything flawlessly. Um, I remember uh, when I entered uh, a new church as a freshly appointed pastor, I came with a bit of experience to this church and uh, but I was still pretty young and I had it in my mind that since I had had uh, this experience and that experience, that as soon as I walked in the door, that everyone would be really quick to follow me. Didn't they know where I'd been and what I'd done? Uh, but that congregation helped to wake me up to reality pretty quickly and remind me what we, what we know and probably what I had just forgotten. And that is that um, my ability to lead in that place would hinge on uh, relationships the quality of, the, of my relationships with the people in that church, and that that would take time. And it would take uh, me consistently showing up and being uh, who I had been in other places before I could lead there. So uh, relational congruence is this second skill set. And it's worth all of us reflecting, um, especially in these times that are calling us to move and act in different ways and have different kinds of patterns week to week. Um, to reflect on our habits and patterns and think about which of those are building trust and which inadvertently could be eroding trust and to ensure that we're being intentional about uh, deepening our trust in this time. Kami, you wanna uh, take it from there? Sure. So here we are as leaders and we find ourselves in a place where uh, change has been thrust upon us um, or that we've decided that in order to fulfill our mission, our purpose, everything that we need to do in the future, um, we need to initiate change. And so uh, when that happens, oftentimes um, what happens to our system is that the uh, persons decide where they think and what they think and feel about the direction where we're going or, or what's happening or how, um, uh, the change is impacting them. So there are six different ways that we could be uh, oftentimes find ourselves in relationship with people. Um, so there are uh, right before you, that's the six ways, allies. So those are the persons who will help you and others um, like in the metaphor, uh, climb the mountain. Um, they'll figure out when you get to particularly difficult places, how to help you along the way. Um, they, they're on board all the way and they're going to be your allies, they're going to walk with you. Um, there are the confidants. These are people who are uh, loyal to you. Um, you. These are people that you show your vulnerabilities to that can help you along the way. They'll support you. Um, they want to help you be successful. Um, their investment is in you and um, all, along the way, um, uh, they will care for you and, and give you input so that you can succeed. Um, they're also your opponents. And so uh, your opponents, it's important to recognize, are not your enemies. Um, these are people who are stakeholders with a different perspective. Um, and most of the time, these are the people that have the most to lose. So it's good to listen to them, um, to consider their thoughts. Uh, but you have to watch out because they're likely to be the ones that don't want change. Um, so you need to ask the question, are the ideas that they're offering me um, taking me uh, to the place of being able to fulfill the mission or the goals that are set before me? Um, 
these folks will debate the ideas um, and you can spend time debating the ideas with them uh, with the hope of, of, of listening, but also bringing them on board. Um, and it's important uh, as, as uh, something that I think Andy just said to really as the, um, the leader to, to value every single person. And so the, the tone that you have with them um, with your opponents is is key um, to to hold as someone uh, s uh, said in the uh, in the book Anatomy of Peace to hold that sort of position of peace of of being willing to listen and um, also try to help folks on board because the the questions that they ask, that these opponents ask are important questions that need to be answered. The next one is your senior authorities. Um, these are people who need to know. Um, that you're climbing the mountain. Uh, they generally want to know your plan. Um, they'll have your back. They'll support you. Um, and they are people that uh, you that we are to honor. And so um, those are really key people in making sure that they're on board. And then the uh, next is the casualties. Now, um, any time that there is change, um, there's off, there's going to be casualties. Um, these people are, um, well, they have to decide if they're going to follow you or if they can even follow you. Um, they may not have the ability. Uh, they either don't want to or they don't have the capacity uh, to make the trip. Um, these can be painful losses, uh, but what's important is to recognize that there's going to be some casualties and being able to attend to the, the persons who um, just can't make uh, the trek with you is really important. So, you know, I find, it, I've always found it interesting that in our hymnal, uh, our book of worship, I believe, there is a, um, in the book of worship, there's a, a little liturgy for those who are going to be leaving the church. And, um, you know, oftentimes we think of those as, as persons who are, um, you know, moving just to another city or something like that. But, but um, what if we considered those who, who can't go alongside of us as those to be blessed? Um, and even if it's just um, the leader blessing them to do something different, um, there's closure in that. And in some instances, um, you know, persons uh, really um, can think through what it actually means to, to have somebody willing to love them and bless them um, in, a, in a way that is full of grace. Um, maybe they'll even uh, find a way to have capacity to not be the casualty that they thought they were going to be. So it's uh, important to remember them as, you, as we consider um, change management. The last uh, are the dissenters. It took me a while to really understand the difference between the opponents and the dissenters, but I think the clarity that I got in this is that um, Todd Bolsinger says that these people are the naysayers who are the canaries in the coal mine who help you see how opposition will be formed. They ask very good questions, They're, they voice radical ideas, and they often mention the unmentionable. I think the difference between the opponents and the dissenters is that they, um, they it's not that they have a lot to lose. Um, they just have uh, other ideas. They see the mountain and they wanna go another route. Uh, they think their idea is a better way and it truly might be a better way. Um, they ask, why are we doing it that way? And it's absolutely important for leaders to consider the why. And so they lift up questions that may absolutely be imperative and helpful for the leader to jump in and um, engage the dissenters in, in um, seeing if they really are going the right direction to fulfill the mission that um, you wanna fulfill. So it's important to seek their engagement. And um, as Andy said, it's really important to attend to each of these relationships 
um, not to avoid in any matter um, those uh, any of these relationships because they're all of, of valued people that need uh, to be a part of, of moving forward. Now, there's, uh, a, I'm just gonna say one last thing, and that is that uh, we should all expect sabotage. Um, uh, I'll never forget uh, a conversation that I had with uh, one of the pastors in the Metro District who said, oh my gosh, I read that whole section on expecting sabotage and what sabotage, uh, uh, that you have to almost have sabotage moments and survive that, or you have to survive a sabotage actually, in order to know that real culture change has happened. And uh, in order to, to uh, survive that, um, it's important to, to engage in every part of the relationships that are listed uh, here um, in the book. Andy? All right, so um, I think now is the time that we will uh, shift into our first breakout discussion. All right, I think you jump in on adaptive capacity. I do, I do. And friends, again, well, if, if there's a desire to return to um, any of um, the content related to technical competency or relational congruence, we'll have time for Q&A at the very end and uh, definitely can hold some space for that. But yeah, I think we want to move forward to um, the third of those three skill sets or uh, competency areas. And um, in this one, it's probably appropriate that it's saved for last when we're talking about change agility, uh, and that's adaptive capacity. So you see the image there and some of um, the notes related to adaptive capacity. So another one of those mantras that uh, leaps out of the book as you read it is this one. It says that uh, we should let go, learn as we go, and keep going no matter what. And again, it's that middle phrase that uh, is an anchor for this section, to learn as we go. Uh, at its core, any kind of adaptive journey like we're on now is one in which uh, the leader and the people go on a learning journey together. And that through that learning process, uh, it's a, a wholly transformational kind of experience. And so if we think about the scriptures and what they tell us about um, learning and being on a learning process, um, I'm reminded of one of the stories in the Gospels. Uh, it shows up in Luke 18 in particular, where uh, the disciples are trying to fend off children who want to be in Jesus's presence, but Jesus welcomes them. And then there's this quotation that is familiar, I'd imagine, to many of us, and that is that Jesus says that the kingdom of God belongs uh, to people like these children. And at least part of what that means, I think, is uh, that Jesus is lifting up uh, a kind of stance of humility. Uh, the book talks about uh, the necessity of having a humble stance of curiosity um, and awareness and attentiveness to what's happening. Uh, that kind of humble stance uh, puts us in a frame uh, in which we can learn. And then the real meat of what Bolsinger shares um, about being on this learning journey that's a part of our adaptive capacity is uh, he outlines an actual three-step process um, for, for this learning. As I was jotting these down, I was reminded of some workshops that uh, Owen Ross and Cami Gaston and myself were a part of leading back last year about new faces, new spaces. And in that setting, we talked about sort of the creative process of uh, praying and then preparing and then piloting and then perceiving and then the uh, then it continues in a kind of circle where after we perceive then we pray and prepare and pilot again and again 
So Bolsinger has a similar kind of process that he offers to us, again, to help us maybe uh, stay very intentionally in a learning mode. And this process has three parts. So the first part is observations. And he talks about the importance of, um, of looking from the balcony, of carving out time to uh, step back and ensure that we're seeing clearly uh, the challenge that we're facing in this moment. But he, very quickly, he's careful to say that um, our observations can't only come from the balcony, uh, that gleaning observations is not a, a solitary exercise for a leader, that as we look from the balcony, we also have to listen from the floor. Or another analogy he uses is we have to listen from those, listen to those who were on the playing field itself. Um, so that would, it just encourages us to be sure that um, as we're observing what's happening in our communities, in our congregations, in the lives of the people that um, we're doing community with, it's important that we listen to and learn from a wide range of those voices. So, you know, not only our staff, if we're pastors, um, not only our confidants and key trusted leaders, um, but uh, it's important that we listen to people in every facet of our congregation, even our opponents and dissenters, as, as Cami lifted up previously, um, even those who are um, on the fringe of our community um, and those who are not yet a part of our community. Um, all of those voices um, can give us invaluable insight into what's happening. And again, I want to just emphasize again, it's critical that we take in observations from people outside of our church as well as inside, if we hope to um, lead through this adaptive journey well. So observations is the first step, uh, gathering data and insight. And then the second one is interpretations. So this is the step in which we um, discern from among all of those observations, uh, patterns and meaning. And again, it's probably critical for us to do that discernment, uh, not alone, but with other uh, trusted voices uh, in our congregation. Um, another way to think about this is that uh, it's the, the time to try to make sure we're seeing the forest for the trees. We have all of these data points, but what does it mean? And what is it? Uh, implying for us. And then the third step he calls interventions. So again, observations, interpretations, and then interventions. And this is where we begin to experiment. Uh, in, in the book, Bolsinger is helpful in lifting up some principles for interventions. Um, he, he says it's important to start small. Uh, again, that word experiment is helpful. Uh, we can begin uh, small and even playfully and, um, and grow from there. Uh, the second principle he offers is that it's important that our interventions are consistent with our church's DNA. Um, this is, ex these experiments, this is not the moment for us to forward our own personal agenda um, that has nothing to do with the church's own values and history and sense of calling. Um, our experiments ought to be, again, consistent with who our church has been and hopefully, uh, again, build upon it and be that next uh, stage of growth and development for the church. And then uh, last is, he says, um, with regard to interventions, that we should always expect resistance. And we've um, touched on that a bit <laughs> already. Um, one last thing I'd mention about uh, interventions is that it's probably helpful for us to be clear that um, we resist the desire for these interventions to be a quick fix. Uh, when we're in this time of uncertainty, uh, when we're in uncharted waters, I mean, all of us, uh, leaders included, are, are going to be enticed by the, the notion that we can find um, a quick fix, a silver bullet, that if we just do this one thing, then it will solve all of our challenges. Uh, it's probably helpful for us to be clear-eyed about that and resist that uh, desire. The flip side of that is 
to resist um, things dying in committee because we talk about them forever before we ever try. <laughs> um, so again, uh, after adequate preparation, it's good to then pilot, to start small, experiment, and uh, see what happens. I think this is this uh, three-step process is critical for us um, because our our uh, phase of experimentation is not over. Um, it, it didn't end when we figured out how to have online presence and do ministry online. Um, as we emerge from sheltering in place, the world we'll step in, back into won't be the same world we left. And, and so this learning process continues for us as our church figures out how to thrive uh, in the new normal. And so I hope that uh, we can continue to hold on to that principle of um, observations, interpretations, and interventions. Cami? Sure. So when we're in that process of learning um, about what's going on, um, it's really important to um, do that through the lens of your mission and, uh, and your vision. So, I mean, all of us, I think, uh, because we've been around the church for a while, have done our vision and mission work. Um, uh, what's the mission statement of our church? And, and we've come up with quite a few. Um, over the years in, in my life. And so I've, I've thought about that. Um, um, what happens when things seem to change? So I want to just say a couple things about mission and vision. So when you have an adaptive challenge, um, it's essential to clarify your mission and re and look at it <laughs> really, really closely. Um, and reevaluate how your vision and organization will fulfill your mission. So um, first, it's absolutely imperative to, to know your mission. Um, what are you seeking to accomplish? Um, and so I, I think that uh, it's important to develop a very clear focus that will guide, um, that will be your mission, that will guide all of your decisions. Um, so have a mission that is big enough and broad enough to connect with a, a varied context that you want to reach. So uh, I was thinking about this context of canoeing the mountains and um, their mission was to explore a waterway passage from east to west. And in the midst of that, their vision, their mission <laughs> had to change. They they had to take out that word waterway because they couldn't, they didn't have, um, the Missouri River did not go all the way to the West Coast. So their mission changed to explore a passage from East to West. They had to look at that, that whole, um, you know, um, mission and clarify it with even greater understanding. Um, so when you're up against a new challenge, um, how are you going to uh, clarify your, your mission? And then how are you going to change your vision and organization in order to get you where you want to go? So keep that in mind, that same visual of Lewis and Clark trying to get um, um, from the east of, uh, to the west. And as they're making their way, um, they are trying to fulfill their mission and they find it, uh, they find themselves in the middle of these um, mountains that they, they can't traverse uh, via the, the uh, essential way they thought they were going to. So, um, so I really appreciate the, the, the question that um, is brought up from the book. Uh, are you willing to ditch the canoe to move forward? To, to fulfill your mission. Um, so I wanna ask these questions. What DNA is essential and needs to be preserved in your mission statements and in your visions? Um, think about what essential personnel, what essential supplies that, um, that the, the, uh, Lewis and Clark needed to think to, to, to take when they got out of their canoes and needed to get from um, the Rocky, over the Rocky Mountains and into the next place that they're gonna, they were gonna be. Uh, what DNA needed to be discarded? So in their case, a vehicle uh, that ha had to be 
discarded a canoe? Um, what are new delivery uh, systems or tools that you might uh, need to put in place or create? What new partnerships might you need to have in order to uh, get you uh, to uh, fulfill your mission? So in the case of uh, canoeing the mountains, um, they needed to have some persons who, who were familiar with the native lands. They needed to have persons who had ex um, um, that sort of DNA of being an explorer. And, um, and I think in the same way, we as a church need to discard some of our, um, our old ways of doing things um, and create in our own DNA uh, partnerships with um, persons that can help us explore the new ways of being and, um, and offering Christ to another. Um, as Annie said, it's, it's really important to take um, a balcony view, or, or as they might say in that book, uh, to stand on, on the mountain and survey the land, see what the, what the whole picture looks like, um, and at the same time have those who are living in the land tell us um, what, it, what it can look like when we are engaging in a relationship um, with um, the, the, this new challenge. So I wanna give you just a, um, a quick visual of, uh, hopefully I can do this quickly, of, of something that the cabinet did. I'm gonna invite you all to sit around the cabinet table for a minute, something I'm sure all of you wished you could always speak into. So, um, so we sat around the cabinet table and we came up with um, a few, couple years ago, um, some things that, that we would consider to be um, our mission and things that needed to vision wise need to change. So I'm gonna give you just a, a little insight to what we came up with. Um, we said that uh, one of the vision statements that came out of it uh, was this, uh, lead people to know, love, and follow Jesus so they can transform the world with a God whom we believe is full of grace, openness, holiness, and love. Then we said, we need to identify old cultural norms that need, we need to leave behind. So the canoe we need to leave behind. And what's the canoe we need to get into or what's the, the backpack we need to put on the back of our backs and create for a new culture. Um, so, so what's the old culture? What's the new culture that we wanna create? And this is from the perspective of our cabinet work. So um, how we do our work with the churches. So we said, in the old culture, the clergy is the client, the one we were working for. In the new culture, we see the clergy as a resource. In the old culture, we see the congregation as a client. But in the new culture, we see the congregation as a resource. In the old culture, we see leading to improve or improvement work. But in the new culture, leading to create and innovate. See the difference? Improvement work, innovation work. In the old culture, either or. In the new culture, both and. We know we need to be uh, two, different, two different ways of being the church. In the old culture, uh, we were an attractional model where the focus was going to the church. In the new culture, it's a mission field model where we're going out from the church. In the, in the old culture, we, uh, the, the laity was the consumer. But in the new culture, we want to empower the laity to be ministers, uh, which I think they've already always been. <laughs> um, but it's a new focus on, on really equipping. Um, and then I'm just going to give you a couple more. Um, in the old culture, status quo oriented. In the new culture, a results oriented. In the old culture, uh, we were culturally segregated. But in the new culture, uh, we, would, we would like to be culturally diverse. So those, those are some of the top things that we did in order to clarify um, 
how we could move from an, an old canoe uh, and, and leave that behind into new ways of being. And I'm gonna pass it. Uh, at the, and these are examples of things that you could do in your own church when you identify what's the old culture that we've had to the new culture. Awesome, yeah, thanks, Cammie. So uh, the last facet of um, adaptive capacity builds right on what Cammie was talking about because when um, in, a, in a congregation, when we're talking about um, shifts in culture, uh, developing new culture, uh, that implies change. And change brings loss. And a sense of loss in a congregation um, is experienced as grief. And so there's, a, there's an emotional component to uh, leading through change. And it's important that we not ignore or underestimate the emotional challenge that's inherent uh, to adaptive leadership. And so uh, the book, I think, is very helpful in saying that that emotional challenge is twofold. Uh, part of it is that we as the leader, whether we're clergy or lay, uh, we as a leader must stay calm, uh, monitor our own emotional uh, responses to the, the changes that we're living into. Even if we're a part of leading them, we still may experience our own um, emotions around them. I might uh, ask you to think about some of the emotions that you've experienced over the last couple of months as you've been a part of uh, the adaptive work um, that has been before you. Um, perhaps you felt at times excited, um, at other times exhausted. Uh, as the leader, you yourself may have uh, been sort of felt exhilarated by uh, the new ways of sharing the gospel and connecting with people. And you may at times have had your own grief to work through, um, missing standing in a pulpit in front of a congregation and connecting with people in that way um, as one example. So it's important for us to be aware of and monitor our own uh, emotions in the midst of uh, these changes. And it's helpful for us to be aware of um, the triggers that we may have, the, those things that tend to hook us and then um, invite us to kind of lose our calm and our cool. <laughs> and it's helpful to uh, recognize that, um, that anxiety that maybe we bring to our church can be contagious um, and calm and cool that we bring to our congregation, even online, digitally, as we're connected, uh, can be contagious. So knowing our triggers is helpful. And uh, I, again, I think uh, the book is helpful to lift up some common ones um, acceptance um, is one. If we feel as though uh, we are not being accepted, that may trigger us to not to lose our cool and not uh, live into our best selves. Um, competence could be a trigger. If we find ourselves in a place where we don't feel particularly on top of things, I'm sure we've all been there the last couple of months. Uh, for some of us, that could be a trigger that may then um, kind of invite us to uh, move and act um, out of fear or anxiety. Um, and control is certainly another one. Uh, a sense of loss of control could trigger us and then um, <laughs> invite us to, to flail about trying to regain that control in ways that aren't helpful. So part of the emotional challenge is for us to monitor our own emotions as the leader and stay calm. Uh, the other, the the other piece of it is to uh, monitor and sort of regulate the, the heat is sort of the metaphor, the heat that our congregation is experiencing. Uh, one of the greatest takeaways in Canoeing the Mountains, I think, is this metaphor of a crock pot and what that means for our leadership. If you think about a crock pot and crock pot cooking, um, you, know, you typically put into a crock pot uh, a whole mix of um, uh, you know, chopped or diced vegetables, maybe bits of uncooked meat and a base, you um, put it in there and, and at first um, everything is hard, uncooked, 
but with uh, time and proper temperature, all of the vegetables and the bits of, of meat and other elements all blend together to form something new and savory. Um, but it takes time, and the other, the other variable there is the heat. If we turn the heat up too fast on the crock pot, then the stuff burns to the bottom and doesn't taste good at all. If there's not enough heat, then, uh, then the vegetables and the meat never soften and their flavors don't blend. And so the challenge of leadership is to strike that delicate balance as we lead in a congregation to have enough heat that change continues to move forward, but not so much that people get burned. Um, one of the, uh, again, quotes in this section says that as leaders, uh, we must disappoint our people at the rate they can absorb. That's, I think, really worth repeating. Um, that uh, if we're going to be leading through change, it's inevitable that we will disappoint our people um, here and there or at some level. But um, if we're wise, we'll disappoint our people at the rate they can absorb. But it gives them um, the space and the time they need to grieve over the things that are changing. So maybe a, a question to leave you with that we might wrestle with in the breakout room is, um, how are we in our congregations creating space for people to grieve the changes that we're all experiencing in our congregational life together? And moving forward, as we think about reemerging from sheltering in place, how will we create space for our congregation to grieve as we create a new normal in our churches? All right, so we've reflected some on the different facets of uh, adaptive capacity. And so we have time now for um, some further breakout conversation. Again, our facilitators have some questions to guide us. I think we're all back. Do you want to um, sure. wrap us up with the sure. uh, few minutes we've got left? Okay, we just have a couple of minutes, but um, I, I want you guys to take a look at that graphic that's in front of you. Um, we've been talking about, we talked about technical competence, so being able to lead when you're on the map, um, um, and that, that map could be anything that, that any, anything you are overseeing um, and doing it well. Relational congruence that had to do with how it is you are in relationship with people and attentive uh, to those relationships, um, no matter how easy or hard they are. Um, and then adaptive capacity, um, you know, ways to help cha change management. Uh, um, and so um, the, the center part of that is uh, transmit transformational leadership, which um, is what happens when we attend to all three of those areas. And so um, I always want to lift up before you all um, the fact that um, the book is an excellent book. Uh, we only covered a few things um, on the book, um, but you know, basic kinds of things, but I think it's worth a full read. Um, I did give you the opportunity to have a download of the Canoeing the Mountains Christian Leadership in Uncharted Territory. Um, there's some notes that I want to thank Sarah Calvert, Reverend Sarah Calvert, uh, for putting them together. She is from the Virginia Conference, and she has a workbook in there that you can do personally and with your leadership so that you can uh, do some adaptive uh, work, uh, uh, change management work, uh, for to assess where you are right now and where you want to go. Um, there is on the last pa pages of the book, um, a recap of the whole book. I'm not going to speak those to you, but on page 217 and 18 um, are uh, listed there. And I gave that outline to all the lay leaders last a few years ago in the Metro District. And they took that and, and worked with their churches. Um, and I think um, that's really all I wanted to share uh, around just being able to use those resources, take all those, um, uh, the book and, um, and follow, I think, a, a really good workbook. And then we'll just ask if there's any questions that you guys have as we end today's um, webinar and see if we can 
um, help you out. So you can put those uh, in the um, chat or you can unmute yourself and just ask the question. And, and maybe I just want to jump in real fast before we move to Q&A. Um, uh, Owen uh, reminded me, and I, I was planning to do this, I'm glad he did, um, that uh, tomorrow the Center for Church Development is offering uh, another webinar at 1.30 on uh, Tech Talk. Uh, this, that center has gathered some technology and media experts from uh, some of our churches in the conference to share their know-how how about hardware, software, subscription services, all the kinds of things that we're learning about so rapidly and, um, and, and trying to get up to speed on. And so um, to put that one in your calendar tomorrow, 1.30, uh, another, another really helpful webinar coming from the North Texas Conference for you. Yeah, it's actually on Thursday. But oh, that, yeah. I was thinking today was Wednesday. Yeah, you're right. Thursday. Thanks, man. It's Are Groundhog you know? Day during COVID-19. <laughs> For real. Is it Saturday? <laughs> what day is it? <laughs> Do you think groundhog, the groundhog will like shelter in place? What? <laughs> Gosh. Oh. Any questions or comments that you all would like to uh, ask before we move on? Yeah, Cammie, this is Evelyn. I was wondering, do you have that outline that you provided lay leaders a couple of years ago? Is that still around somewhere? I do. I have it. I, um, I can send it out to the list. Okay. All right. Thank or you. you. Yeah. All right. I'd like to have it. Yes. Thanks, Evelyn. We, we uh, <laughs> had a great conversation about finding space for, for grieving, and I was wondering what may also may have come from some of the other groups. Finding space for grieving. Danielle Kim had a great uh, comment about um, um, just being real and honest. Danielle, are you still on the call? Yes, I am. Can you speak to that? Yeah, no, I was just um, talking about how um, I'm subscribed to different teacher groups in Facebook and um, they put out very short one page, you know, Instagram sort of a page, three line sort of um, narrative of how teachers are feeling, you know, with this. And so, you know, they'll say something like, you know, classroom being empty, you know, not being able to say goodbye to kids. So um, when um, the Facebook puts out those kinds of, those groups put out stuff like that, where I relate to, then that's an opportunity for me to um, share that um, and, you know, just, personally have the opportunity to um, process that narrative that I relate to. And so um, I was just suggesting that um, we might be able to provide a space for um, our folks to um, grieve um, when we um, are able to, um, in social media, pl media platform where we can just, um, you know, um, put out narr narratives that they can relate to and um, allow them to share and allow them to um, sort of have that personal um, um, moment to process with our community. And so that's what I was sharing. Am I, am I making sense? I'm just okay. hearing blank. Yeah. <laughs> so she was saying, saying what they, they miss, you know, I miss being with you. I'm, I miss, you know, and allowing people to, to, to just be in the real, think about the real. Thanks. Any other thoughts and or questions? Okay. All right, well, we thank you all for joining us today and um, thank the facilitators as well. And um, um, just keep, keep on um, connecting to um, being great leaders in our conference. We appreciate all you're doing. Thanks. Thank you, good to see everybody. All right. Peace be with you. Thank you, Cammie and Andy. Uh.